it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Cameron Gordon for the first uh, lecture in this afternoon. And uh, I saw that uh, there are people uh, online. So if you are online, uh, you can uh, ask questions by unmuting or on the chat and somebody will tell. Well, thank you very much. And of course, I'd first like to thank the organizers very much for the invitation to speak at this conference. It's an honor to uh, participate in this commemoration of uh, Vaughan Jones's contributions to, to mathematics and to the mathematical community more widely. Um, you know, when I think of Vaughan, I, the, the phrase larger than life sort of comes to mind. I mean, ev everything he did, you know, he did with 110% uh, you know, of everything. And uh, this applied to his non-mathematical activities, his sporting activities, for example. We, used to, we played squash for many years, and he was a formidable opponent on the squash court, not to say intimidating uh, at times, but um, we had a lot of fun, played squash in many different uh, locations. And um, on Monday, I guess we heard cer certain references to his beer drinking prowess. Before, before he uh, stopped drinking alcohol. And indeed, you know, after our squash games, we would usually retire to some pub and have a well-earned uh, beverage. And I was very impressed when I noticed that Vaughn ordered his beers in pairs. <laughs> Definitely larger than life. Okay, so I've, I've got a, um, a few um, photographs here. Let's see. I guess I don't. Yeah, what was it? Just press here twice. Oh, that one. And then normally it will work again. Oh, of course not. Okay, give me a second. Uh -huh. Sorry. du pointeur qui se remet automatiquement dans une mauvaise fonction qui empêche le bon fonctionnement du reste pour une raison inconnue. Just press twice and okay, 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 good. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah, so I was going to show. Um, so <laughs> here's Vaughan. There was this rather in famous or infamous uh, conference in Delphi in 1998, Knots and Hellas. Uh, some of you might have been there. So there's Vaughan, and there's another one of Vaughan. Um, yeah, the mayor of Delphi awarded him the keys to the city uh, there. But, and here's an. There's Vaughan enjoying a cigar. <laughs> and I think this was the beginning of the famous evening where Vaughan's Fields Medal went missing. <laughs> but it showed up the next day, so all was well. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> right, so I'm going to talk about, uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about some joint work with, uh, uh, with Michel Boileau, Steve Boyer, and Ying Hu. I mean, strictly speaking, is going to be uh, some joint work with Michelle and Steve, and then some more joint work with, with Steve and Yang. So um, let me give some, yeah, so let me first give some background. I'm going to discuss a, a conjecture about the cyclic branch covers of certain kinds of links. But to give, let me give some background um, and describe another conjecture. Um, so all three manifolds of links will assume to be prime. I'm not going to say that every time. And so let me first describe something called the L-space conjecture, which um, involves three properties that a closed, orientable three-manifold might have. OK, so, the, so let me describe these properties. The first one is, I'll refer to it as LO. So I'll say that a three-manifold, a closed, connected, orientable three-manifold is LO if its fundamental group is left orderable. But, and by the way, its fundamental group, I'll also assume it's non-trivial. I'll, I'll assume that left orderability uh, <coughs> implies non-triviality. OK, so left-orderable means that there's a total, strict total order on the group 
which is invariant under left multiplication. So this is a purely group theoretic uh, concept. And of course, there's nothing magical about left invariance. Um, it's easy to prove that a group is left orderable if and only if it's right orderable, but, but not simultaneously. It'll be, it'll be a different order, right? But, uh, so you choose left to right according to your political leanings, and uh, we'll go with left. Okay, so um, for three manifold groups, uh, it turns out that uh, this is equivalent, there's a kind of dynamical um, characterization of this. It's equivalent to saying that there's a non-trivial homomorphism from this fundamental group to the group of orientation preserving homeomorphisms of the real line. Um, and so, yeah, so that's, um, there are two parts to this. I mean, the, the first part is kind of classical, that this group, homeo plus R, is left orderable. And then there's a, a more recent uh, result which only applies to three manifold groups, that it's enough for a three manifold group to have a non-trivial uh, left orderable quotient in order that it be, uh, be left orderable. So, um, so that's, anyway, that's the notion of LO. Okay, and there's another, there's another notion um, which comes from Hagard fleur homology, which I will say nothing about other than that um, Osvath and Sabo in around about 2000 uh, introduced this theory of Hagard fleur homology and they showed that to a closed orientable three manifold, you could associate a finite dimensional vector space, let's say over Z2, HF hat, and the dimension of this is always, they showed it's always greater than or equal to the order of the ordinary first homology of the manifold. Of course, we interpret this to be zero if it's infinite. And uh, one of the first applications of their theory to sort of classical problems in knot theory was to this unsolved problem about, you know, which knots have Dane surge that give you lens spaces, the so-called so Berge conjecture. And they gave, uh, they used their theory to give some, you know, new uh, obstruction for that, for that to happen. And then they noticed that really, they didn't really use the fact that the surgery in question gave a lens space. They just used the fact that this inequality was actually an equality for lens spaces. And so they, they realized that uh, their proof applied to what they called L spaces. So an L space is, um, uh, is, is, is a three manifold where, where, where this is an equality, right? And so NLS just stands for it's not an L space. So that just means that this inequality is strict. Um, so that's a, a, another um, property that a three manifold might or might not have. It might be not an L space. And finally, uh, it might admit a co-orientable taut foliation. So this is a co-dimension one foliation, and everything's sort of oriented. That's what all of this means. And taut just means that there's a simple closed curve that meets every leaf and, and meets every leaf transversely. And so we'll refer to that property as CTF. So uh, there's this conjecture that kind of lies behind what I'm going to say, the L-space conjecture. It says uh, that these, these three properties are all equivalent. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the interest of this is that you know, these three properties are all rather different in, in nature, right? I mean, one is purely group theoretic. One is Hagard fleur homology is ultimately sort of analytic and uh, having a coordinate top foliation, that's just sort of geometric topological, you know? And so um, this conjecture sort of suggests that all these three things are equivalent. Let me make, so let me make some remarks about um, that. First of all, um, it's known that CTF implies NLS. So if your manifold has a coordinate top foliation, then it can't be an L space. The dimension of its Hagar for homology has to be greater than the, 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 uh, the size of the first homology of the, of the manifold. But that's the only implication that's known in general. Um, another extreme case is when the first homology of the manifold is infinite, and then it turns out that such a manifold has all three properties. So I'll use star to denote any one of these three properties, okay. <clears throat> so at, at one extreme, if H1 is infinite, then everything's, everything uh, holds. On the other, at the other extreme, if the fundamental group is finite, then none of these properties hold. Um, certainly, if you have a finite group, it can't be left orderable. That's easy to see. And, uh, 
the finite, the, the manifolds of finite fundamental group are now known um, after Perlman, you know, just to be the, the spherical manifolds. And, and so it's, it's, it's known that they are not, the, the, sorry, it's known that they are, they are all L spaces, including lens spaces. I mentioned that, you know, the, the term L space comes from lens spaces. They were known to be L spaces before, but now all the manifolds of finite fundamental group are L spaces. And again, they can't have, well, therefore, they can't have corrigible top foliations. So the interesting case is when the first homology is finite, but the fundamental group is infinite. And there, you know, both things can happen. And uh, so that's, that's sort of the interesting case. And then, in fact, of course, we don't know that this conjecture is true. And so sometimes we know for certain classes of three manifolds that one of these properties holds, but maybe we don't know about the other two, and so on and so on, you know. Um, anyway, that's... Um, a little bit of a background there. So I'm going to be talking about, yes, yeah, cyclic branch covers of links. So, so let's, here we have uh, an oriented M component link in the three sphere. That's a picture of one of the components. So I'll use uh, X sub L to denote the exterior of, of the link, just the, the complement of an open, an open neighborhood. And, uh, you know, the uh, first homology of this exterior is free abelian generated by these oriented meridians. So because the link is oriented, we can uh, define this oriented meridian. And uh, there's a canonical map then from pi one of the exterior to Z mod n, if we just fix some n greater to two, where we send each meridian to one. And this induces an n-fold cyclic cover, which extends to a, an n-fold cyclic branch cover um, from this closed three manifold. I'll refer to, I'll call that sigma sub NL to S3. So th th this is an old construction in, uh, in link theory. Goes back to Hagard's thesis, actually, 1898. Um, Hagard uh, showed that, you know, you take a link and you can look at the, you know, the, the N-fold cyclic branch, you get a closed three manifold. In particular, he showed that if you take the Hopf link and you take the double branch cover, you get real projective three space, you get RP3. And that was the example that he used to point out that Poincaré had got his Poincaré duality theorem wrong. And so he wrote to Poincaré and said, hey, you need to, you need to correct this, you know. So it was, it was a... It was, no, no, the Poincaré duality. Sorry, Poincaré duality. Yeah, yeah, Poincaré got it wrong first time. He, he didn't allow for torsion. And so Hagar pointed out that RP3, the second homology is zero, but the first homology is not zero. And that, that contradicted something that Poincaré had said. Anyway, but um, so he, um, right, so, so this, I mean, there are two, if you take a link, an oriented link, there are actually two sort of, you know, well-known ways of constructing closed three manifolds from that. You can take, you could, you know, parameterized, you know, simply parameterized. You could take these n-fold cyclic branch covers, or you could do Dane, Dane filling, you know, you could do Dane surgery. So each... That would be parameterized by, you know, M rational numbers if you have an M component link. Okay. Um, by the way, yeah, talking about links, I mean, I seem to remember when, you know, when Vaughan did his first, introduced his polynomial, you would, you would sometimes see uh, popular articles about knots saying, well, you know, knots can look really complicated, but they're really the unknot, you know, and, and so topologists try to define invariants that tell you that a knot's non-trivial, and uh, well, this Alexander did this in 1928, and it was quite good, but it wasn't perfect, and then Jones, but now Jones has got the thing, and it's much better, you know, it's much better, you know. But of course, that's, <laughs> that's not the main point of the Jones polynomial, right? I mean, it was important because it, uh, it made these fantastically deep connections between, uh, you know, knot theory and totally unexpected other areas of, of mathematics. Um, so it was a real breakthrough. And in fact, this seems to happen every 10 or 20 years that some totally new idea comes into knot theory and three-dimensional topology. And uh, Vaughan's work was one of them. By the way, it's still an interesting question whether the Jones polynomial does detect the unknot. I mean, I'm not saying that's, that's still a f very important question. But here's a, here, but here's a simpler invariant that um, detects the unknot. So I'm going to... You define f of k to be zero if k is the unknot, and f of k is one if it's not the unknot. <laughs> you laugh, but that, that, that's a that's a well-defined function, and it, it's a well-defined knot invariant. What's what's a, what's wrong with it? 
the point is it's not clear that it's computable, right? <laughs> you want to say computable. And, but, but one of the huge breakthroughs in knot theory was Harkin's work in the late 50s when he showed, yeah, that function is computable, actually. And so, uh, and so his work, of course, gave rise to uh, the subsequent work of Waldhausen. And, and so by the, by, so this is, I think this is one of the main kind of, uh, you know, eras of three-dimensional topology, where by the end, by the mid-1970s, you had a complete classification of knots, you had a solution to the homeomorphism problem for many classes of three manifolds. And then that sort of stopped. Okay, that was just purely geometric topological uh, work using normal surfaces and so on. And then in 1975, Thurston said, you used to be thinking about hyperbolic geometry, you know, and suddenly, whoa, you know, knot theory became infinitely richer and there were geometric invariance, algebraic number theoretic invariance applied to uh, knots, and of course the geometrization conjecture. And then uh, 10 years after that, we had Vaughan, uh, an even more unexpected connection between operator, well, ideas coming from operator algebras into, into knot theory and three-dimensional topology. So probably the next, um, the next big impact, I think, was probably around 2000 when Osvath and Sabo uh, introduced their Hagard floor homology, which again, had a revolutionary um, effect on, on knot theory. The point I'm making is that that was over 20 years ago. And we're due for a new breakthrough. And so you young people out there, get going, all right? <laughs> we're overdue. So, all right. Um, yes, yeah, so, okay, so there's the anaphylactic branch cover. Let's see, what, what am I going to say? All right, so um, if I just restrict to these three manifolds, and for the cyclic branch covers of links, I can ask when, when did they have one or more of these properties star? So let me just give some examples um, to show that just about, just about anything can happen. I'll just give examples of three knots. So here's a knot. And in fact, this knot has the property that all its cyclic branch covers have all three properties for all n equal to two. So the fundamental groups are all left orderable. None of them are L spaces. The, the manifolds all have coordinate thought foliations. By the way, if you, don't, if you want a two-component link with the same property, you could go for that guy. That's, uh, it, it, it also has all three properties. But, um. On the other hand, here's the figure eight knot. And it represents the other extreme. None of its cyclic branch covers have any of these properties, OK? Um. The stickler branch covers this guy, they're all L spaces, and none of them are left orderable. And because they're L spaces, none of them have coordinate dual foliation. On the other hand, here's an example that's going to come up later, the humble trefoil. So it actually, you know, for n between 2 and 5, the n-fold stickler branch cover, this guy actually has finite fundamental group, and so uh, it has none of these three properties. But as soon as n gets to 6, then it turns out that it has all three properties from, from then on. So this is supposed to be some sort of reason for saying, well, let's not look at all links. Let's look at um, uh, a special class of links. So the class of links I'm going to look at could be described topologically, first of all, like this. So, so let's start with a positive hop band. So here's a positive hop band. And you, know, you can plumb. If I, if I have an orientable surface in S3 with boundary, I can plumb one of these bands onto F0 if I choose an arc in A0, and so you get a, this is a picture of plumbing a positive hop band onto F0 along this arc, right? <clears throat> and so I can consider um, the set of all surfaces I get by, you know, cons successively plumbing positive hop bands. And of course, if I take the boundary of such a surface, I'll get a link. And uh, roughly speaking, those are the links I want to consider, except it's not quite true. Uh, you want to enlarge that class a little bit, you could define a surface F to be stably a positive half band plumbing if you can plumb positive half bands onto that surface and get, uh, you know, just a plumbing of positive half bands. Let's say starting with a disk. But anyway, I mean, I'm not. I mean, okay. It turns out that this is a more um, <coughs> this this slightly more general definition has has a, a, a sort of um, <coughs> has other interpretations. But let me just first point out that 
you may think you're not going to get many, very, very many, many surfaces out of this, but you see, there's only one surface you can get just by plumbing one band. Okay, there you go. And the boundary is the hop flank. It's the positive hop flank. So you orient the surface in some way that the user wants to do. Now, there's only two, up to isotopy, there are only two arcs in this annulus, right? There's a, there's a boundary parallel arc and there's the transverse arc. So there's really only two ways of plumbing on a second hop band. One way gives you a connected sum of two hop flanks, if, but we want our links to be prime, so let's do, not do that. So if we do the other one, well, you get the trefoil. So you only, there's only two things. But now, now when you've got the trefoil, now the surface F is a once punctured torus, and now there are infinitely many isotopic classes of arcs. And so now you can, even, even at the next stage, you have infinitely ma many ways of plumbing on positive hop bands. So uh, this is a large class of, um, of uh, surfaces. And like I said, when you have such a surface, you can, the boundary is going to be some link, oriented link, and it'll be a fiber link, and this surface is, in fact, the fiber. So let me say that this, I've given this kind of um, geomet direct geometric uh, in definition of, of this class of links, but there's actually a more intrinsic characterization. That a link is of this form if and only if the uh, contact structure on the three sphere that it induces this vibration induces is the sort of unique tight contact structure on SE. This is the so-called Giroux correspondence. So, so this class of links, you know, has a, has a contact theoretic characterization. And another characterization is that th these are precisely the links that are fibered and strongly quasi-positive. And so I'll refer to these links throughout as FSQP, the fiber strongly quasi-positive. So what's strongly quasi-positive? Well, this is a concept introduced by Rudolph. And it's, you can think of it from a braid theoretic point of view. I mean, that's the origin of the term. You know, you can think of a positive braid. It's just a positive braid, you know, you take two adjacent strands and you cross them over in whatever the positive way, whatever your convention is, right? And uh, a positive braid is just the, a braid that's a product of these positive products. Strongly quasi-positive braid, you can do this, but you, the, the, the strands don't have to be adjacent. So you can take non-adjacent strands and sort of pull them in front of everything and then cross them over, right? And, uh, and, and any braid that's a product of things of that form is called strongly quasi-positive. And, and by the way, I, again, one of the importances of, 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 this, kind of, of this concept is that Rudolph showed that, in fact, these guys have a uh, strongly quasi-positive links, which are the closures of some of the quasi-positive braids, they, um, I mean, th there's actually a complex algebraic characterization uh, of those as well, which <clears throat> leads to some very interesting um, connections and theorems. So in particular, though, uh, as I've just indicated, if you're the closure of a positive braid, and I'll refer to that as braid positive, then obviously you're strongly quasi-positive, and in fact you're also fibered. That's an old theorem of Stallings. And so you can think of the fibered strongly quasi-positive links as being a generalization of the links that are closures of positive braids. And finally, let me make a remark about Dane surgery. So I talked about these L spaces. These L spaces, the manifolds where the Hagard floor homology is as small as possible, you know, consistent with the order of the homology of the, of, of the manifold. And so an L-space knot is a knot that has a non-trivial surgery giving an L-space. For example, you know, a Berge knot has a, has a surgery giving a length space, and so th those would be L-space knots. So there's been a lot of work on, on uh, L-space knots, and um, it turns out that they are fibered strongly quasi-positive. They're fibered by result of knee, and they're strongly quasi-positive by result of hen. So, so this is the class of links I'm going to be looking at, fibered strongly quasi-positive links, and I'm trying to indicate that, yeah, this is very very natural class in, in many ways. So I'm going to be looking at the cyclic branch covers of these, of these links. And one of the motivations for the work I'm going to talk about was, was a question that one of my former graduate students, Alison Moore, asked. If you've got a hyperbolic L-space knot, so in other words, you've got an L-space knot, it's hyperbolic, and it has a Dane surgery that gives you an L-space, look at its double branch cover. Is it always not an L-space? <laughs> okay. So she sort of noticed that... Uh, this seems to be true, that, that if you have a hyperbolic knot that has an L-space surgery, then the double branch cover is not an L-space. It seems that these two ways of constructing three manifolds from, from a knot, uh, they can't both sort of give you, give, both give you L-spaces. 
Now, she, she said hyperbolic because she had to say that because, she, because torus knots, so the PQ torus knot, torus knots are, are, are they're all L space knots. So they have L, in fact, they have length space surgeries. Okay. And then if you look at, the, for example, the two Q torus knots, they're double branch covers, they're length spaces. So um, these are L space knots, and the double branch cover is an L space. But she wondered, she was wondering, um, can this happen for a hyperbolic knot? And by the way, I gave her the opportunity to make this a conjecture. She never wrote this down. She, and she said, no, I'll just leave it as a question. But I think she should have made it a conjecture, because it's almost certainly true. In fact, as I'll indicate, it is true, modular the L space conjecture. Anyway, um, but more, so what, what do you do if you see a question you can't ask? Oops, what did I do there? I really messed up. Wait a minute. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, what do you do when you see a question you can't answer? Well, you generalize the question, right? So, um, so let's generalize the question and just ask if you've got a fiber strongly quasi positive link, so that includes, obviously, that includes L space knots. What can you say about the cyclic branch covers in, you know, as far as these properties are concerned? All right. So this is finally where we come to the uh, ADE links. So again, um, th these have come up many times in this conference already, the, the ADE graphs. So we've got the two infinite families, the AMs and the DMs, and then the three sporadic guys, the 60, 78. The subscript you know, refers to the number of vertices, and um, yeah, so here, uh, here you might as well take m to be at least four because if m is less than four, it degenerates to, to one of the AMs. So I mean, it's 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 well known that these arise. Well, first of all, it, it's <laughs> it's clear that in an obvious way, these graphs correspond to uh, triples of positive integers whose sum of the reciprocals is greater than one. For example, this guy, you know, you've got a, you've, if you look at this vertex valence three, you've got a a branch of, with two vertices, you've got a branch with three vertices, and you've got a branch with five vertices. So this would correspond to two, three, five. This would correspond to two, three, four. This corresponds to two, three, three. This corresponds to two, two, m minus two. And this corresponds to, well, I'll leave you to decide what that corresponds to. You've got various choices with am. But all right. Um, and as, again, as is well known, these, these arrive in, arise in many classification problems. Finite subgroups of SU2, finite Coxer groups, simple complex Lie algebras, certain complex surface singularities, and of course, famously, index and subfactors. We've, we've heard this discussed in, the, in several previous talks here. And the, uh, the graphs in question, of course, they're characterized by the fact that they, they are precisely the graphs, all of whose eigenvalues are less than two. And, um, you know, on Monday, we also heard about, uh, you know, Vaughan's. Uh, love of music and his uh, participation in music. And uh, it occurred to me that the ADE classification kind of arises in music as well, although perhaps not quite the music that Vaughan might appreciate. But, you know, if you want to play rock and roll on the guitar, the only chords you need are A, D, and E. As, uh, so. Um, so given these ADE graphs, you see, we can, we, for, for any one of these, we can construct a link. So what we do, you can, you can use the graph to, uh, as a, instructions to plumb positive Hoffman. So you get a positive Hoffman surface, and then you look at the boundary. So let me give an example. <clears throat> if, we if we take e, E6, so here's E6. So what I'm going to do for every vertex, I take a positive Hoffman, and I'm going to plumb two together if they're joined by an edge. And so you get this rather badly drawn picture, but you get <laughs> this picture. And um, it's a great exercise, by the way. If you, if you, draw, if you draw this on, a, on your blackboard, and then start erasing, look at, just look at the link, forget the surface, just look at the boundary, and then start erasing redundant crossings and moving around, you, you end up with this. <laughs> you, you, you end up with a minus two, three, three pretzel. Pretzel. Is it really important that we stop at the Oh yeah, it's very important, yeah. Uh, oh yeah, 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 oh yeah, you get, you get an eigenvalue greater than two. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, and, and oh, the links make sense. Yes, but, but as I'll explain, you know, it's, it's very important that you, you stop it here. And so, um, okay, and so you can do this, so you can do this with all, with all the a ADE graphs. And here's what you get. For the AM family, you just get the torus knots or links. For the DM family, you get, you know, minus two, two, these pre you get these pretzel links. 
Here you get the, as I point out, you get the pretzel knot, minus 233, minus 234, minus 235. And this turns out actually to also be the torus knot 34. This turns out to be the torus knot 35. And you can see this very close correspondence between these, these triples I was talking about. Okay, so but what, but what's, we're looking at n-fold cyclic branch covers. So it's, it's, easy to, it's easy to show that for these, these links, their complements are all ciphered fibered spaces. And so their double branch covers are all very simple, simple ciphered fibered spaces. And the fact that they are all finite, they're all, the, the fundamental groups are all finite. So these guys, these links, all have the property that the fundamental group of the double branch cover is finite. And so the double branch cover is certainly not star. It's not left orderable. It is an Apple space, and so on and so on. In fact, by the way, the, the fundamental groups that occur as these double branch covers are precisely the finite subgroups of SU2, <clears throat> you know, which come in turn from the finite subgroups of, of SO3. But, um, okay, and so... Here's finally then, finally, the, the conjecture and I'm in, in the title of the talk. Um, that if you've got a fibered strongly quasi-positive link, then all the cyclic branch covers satisfy all three properties, star, unless it's one of these very special guys that clearly don't satisfy that. Okay. So, um, this, this is the, yeah, these, these ADE guys are the only sort of examples where some cyclic branch cover is not a star, you know. Well, yes, because they're, they come from plumbing of positive hot bands. I mean, that's their definition, right? Right? I mean, I, mean, I yeah, I mean, you, if you, I first define the class of links that you get as boundaries of plumbings of positive hot bands. And, and I, then I said, if you allow stable plumbing as well, I mean, that's not important really. That's the same as FSQP, yeah. So anything that's a plumbing of positive hot bands is, is FSQP. Um, well, so let, let me make a couple of remarks here. First of all, if we, if we, res, if we look at this, the NLS version of this conjecture, then this implies a yes answer to, to Alison's question, right? Because the the ADE links are certainly not, they're not hyperbolic, you know. And so um, uh, if you're a hyperbolic L space not, then it would, be a hyper, it would be an FSQP link and it would not be an ADE link. And so all its cyclic branch covers would be, would be uh, NLS. Another important remark here is that if we strengthen the hypothesis on the link from being fiber strongly quasi-positive to being the closure of a positive braid. Remember I pointed out that, <coughs> that BP implies FSQP. Then in fact, the conjecture is true, at least in the NLS setting. And this follows from two theorems. One that, one that, uh, yes, that uh, Michel and Steve and I proved, that, um, that if you've got any strongly quasi-positive link, it doesn't even have to be fibered. If some cyclic branch covers an L space, then the, the quadratic form of the link is definite. So that just means, you know, there's this um, symmetric bilinear form you can define for an oriented link. Um, if you take a minimum genus ciphered surface, then the first homology of that surface will have rank twice the genus, you know, minus, uh, plus a number of components minus one. And so that'll be the rank of the form. And to say it's definite, it's just saying that the absolute value of the signature you know, is, is, is equal to this. Okay, so that's one theorem. And then the other theorem is this beautiful theorem of Sebastian Bader, that if you have a braid positive link, if you have a link as a closure of a positive braid, such, such a thing is definite if and only if it's an ADE link. And so that proves this, this conjecture, at least in the, in the uh, NLS case, right? Because we're talking about, uh, at, at least if, you, if we strengthen this uh, hy hypothesis. And of course, this suggests a, a strategy for proving the conjecture. Namely, you just want to improve this theorem, Bader's theorem, from braid positive to fiber strongly quasi positive. Unfortunately, that doesn't work because uh, this, this theorem is simply false uh, if you generalize this to, uh, it's easily seen to be false. And so you have to do something, something else. So let me just state some of the, some of the results we have towards this conjecture. First of all, there are three um, kinds of links, as everybody knows. This is Thurston's you know, classification of link exteriors. But I'm assuming the links are non-split, by the way. I probably didn't say that. But, um, 
So the exterior of a link, by thirst, it's either a ciphered fibered space or its interior is a, has a complete hyperbolic structure with finite volume, or it contains an essential torus, you know, an incompressible torus that's not parallel to one of the boundary components. And so it's natural to approach this conjecture, in fact, any problem about links, it's natural to approach it <coughs> in these three, uh, these three cases. So the first thing is that the ADE links are ciphered. I think I mentioned that. It's easy to see that the, the, the exterior of a ciphered, of a ADE link is actually a ciphered fiber space. Um, and uh, so the first theorem we proved, this is a joint work with, with Steve and, and Ying Hu, that uh, ciphered links were okay. The ADE link conjecture is true for ciphered links. In fact, as I'll indicate in a little while, much, much more is true, actually. But, but certainly, this is true. So we don't have to worry about the ciphered case. So we look at the other two cases, hyperbolic or toroidal. Now, let me, uh, there, the results, the results we have differ according to whether we're working with LO, NLS, or CDF. And the best results we have are uh, with regard to LO. So let me uh, say what happens there. Like I said, this, the conjecture, remember, really, there are really three conjectures where star is LO, star is, you know, they're all supposed to be equivalent, but we don't know that. So let me say, so, so let's look at the hyperbolic case. Um, well, it turns out that it's true. Uh, there. The, LA, the, A, the LO version of the ADE linkage is true for hyperbolic links. So just spelling that out, that just says if you've got a hyperbolic, fiber strongly quasi-positive link, then all the cyclic branch covers have left orderable fundamental group. I mean, we don't have to make the exception of the ADEs because they're not hyperbolic. So that just leaves toroidal. Uh, and it would be really nice if we could do the LO version, at least for the toroidal case. But unfortunately, we can't quite do that. We have to, there are two cases. If, if you have a toroidal link, then that means its exterior contains this essential torus. And there are two situations. I, if you just look at this torus as it sits in S3, it's either unknotted or it's knotted. You know, it either bounds two solid tori or it bounds a solid torus and, and a non-trivial knot exterior. And we can only handle the knotted case. So <clears throat> if you have a link whose exterior contains a knotted essential torus, then all the cyclic branch covers are left orderable. And one thing to notice about this is that there's no assumption that the link be fibered strongly quasi-positive here. There's just a blanket theorem as long as you've got one of these essential tori. And um, yeah, I, I should say that, you know, <laughs> a special case of a toroidal link is what you call a satellite link. So a satellite link would be where you take a solid torus and you take a link in that solid torus that's non-trivial in an obvious way, and then you tie the solid torus in a non-trivial knot. And that, that's a special case of a toroidal link. That would be a, what's called a, well, that's a satellite link. Um, and of course, by, by definition there, you see that torus, in, the, the boundary of the, I mean, the knot in which you tie the torus, that's called the companion knot. And because that knot is non-trivial, the boundary of a neighborhood of that, that that's going to be the, uh, that's going to be a knotted essential torus. And in particular, if you have a, sat, if you have a toroidal knot, it, it has to be a satellite knot, because it only has one component. And so it, it has to be a satellite knot. And so we at least get that the LO, a, the LO version of the ADE conjecture, at least it's true for knots. And so, again, this shows that it, if you just restrict the L-space knots, I mean, in particular, because they're all five and strongly quasi-positive, right? If you have an L-space knot other than the three knots, that, the, 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 the three classes of knots that appear in the... Uh, ADE classification, the 2Q torus knot, 3, 4, or 3, 5. If it's not one of these, then all the cyclic branch covers are left orderable. And of course, this includes uh, Allison's conjecture, except she didn't ask it for LO, she asked it for, asked it for NLS. But um, at least the LO version is, is, is true. So modular, if, if the L-space conjecture is true, then this answers most question. Let me briefly say uh, something about what happens um, in the NLS or CTF. Um, situation. The results are not quite so strong, but um, one thing we proved with, uh, with Steve and, um, and Michelle is that if you have a fiber strongly quasi-positive link of positive genus, then at least for n greater equal to 6, all the cyclic branch covers are not L spaces. And of course, in, in, in this, uh, with this hypothesis, um, this is actually best possible, because as, as I pointed out, the, 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 the cyclic branch covers of the trefoil between two and five, they actually have finite fundamental group. So you can't improve on this statement directly 
uh, what you'd have, to, you'd have to throw in the assumption that L is hyperbolic or something and try to improve this. And we don't really know how to do that. Let me finally mention at least one result that, that, that holds for all three versions. Uh, any satellite link, which I've just described, uh, if the companion is fibered, then all the cyclic branch covers are, have all these three properties. And you see, that, that actually applies to, that applies to this guy, um, for example. It's a satellite link, the com and the companion is a trefoil, right? And uh, the trefoil is fibered, so. Okay, let me say something very briefly about the proofs. Um, so in the Seifert case, first of all, um, it's an old theorem of Bourdieu and Murasugi that a link is Seifert, its exterior is a Seifert fiber space, if and only if the link is, is a union of Seifert fibers and some Seifert vibration of S3. So, um, you know, the Seifert vibrations of S3 are determined by two relatively prime integers, P and Q. And you've got all these uh, PQ torus knots plus two exceptional fibers of multiplicities P and Q respectively. P and Q might be one. I mean, one or both might be one. And there, of course, one of the, <coughs> one of the um, exceptional fibers disappears. If P and Q are both one, you just get the hot vibration. But, um, and so that implies that the cyclic branch covers of a cipher, like they're all cipher fibered spaces. And the L space conjecture is actually known to be true for cipher fiber spaces. So all these three properties are actually are equivalent uh, for these guys. So we don't have to worry about that. And here's the theorem that I, I said there's actually more is true in, in this setting than just the conjecture. So here's what's true. You take any cipher link. Don't worry whether it's fibered or strongly quasi fiber. Just take any cyphered link. Then all its cyclic, almost always, all its cyclic branch covers have all three properties. The only exceptions, well, of course, we have the ADE links. The ADE links are exceptions. But you see, here you get a little puzzle. The, the double branch cover doesn't depend on the orientation of the, of the components of the link, right? And so we also would have to rule out any cipher link, so, so, which is an ADE link if you forget about the orientation of the, of the fibers. So as long as we rule out... Um, the ADE links and any link that's equivalent to that, you know, if you, as an unoriented link, then, then we're fine. And to get the conjecture for that, you just have to notice, it's just a check, you just check the very small number of examples that arise, that if you have a link that's an ADE link as an unoriented link, but it's not an ADE link as an oriented link. In other words, you take some ADE link with more than one component, there aren't that many, and you flip one of the components. Now you find that you're no longer, you're either no longer fibered or you're no longer strongly quasi-positive. And so, um, you know, the, 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 the conjecture I'm talking about for, for cipher just kind of falls out of this much more general statement. Okay, so that's the cipher case. Let me say something about the hyperbolic case. Oh, well, okay, hence the ADE link in here. So let me say something about the hyperbolic case. So there, it'll be very quick, but I mean, I'll give you the idea. So L is a fibered knot by hypothesis. Right? It's fibered strongly quasi positive. So the monodromy of the fibration is isotopic to a pseudo and also a homeomorphism. I mean, this is, you know, well, you have these two sort of transverse measured foliations, like, you know, in the complement of the periodic points, and <clears throat> they're preserved by, the, by the, uh, this homeomorphism phi. And uh, when you then suspend, you look, you, you, that vibration de determines a flow, a so-called suspension flow, uh, on the complement of the link, and it's called a pseudo anosov flow because it's the suspension of a pseudo anosov homeomorphism. Basically, I mean that's basically the definition of a pseudo anosov flow. And of course, you can now lift that up to a flow on the n-fold cyclic cover. Okay. Now, it, not only is L fibered though, it's also strongly quasi-positive, and so that, by a theorem of Honda, Kazes, and Matic. That means that the fractional dane quiz coefficients of this monodromy is positive, let's say, on each boundary component of the exterior. So this fractional dane twist coefficient, you see what you, you, you've got this monodromy and you normalize it, you normalize it so that's the identity on the boundary, on each boundary component, and the suspension of a point is a meridian, okay. And now you isotope it to this canonical pseudo-nosov representative. And during that isotopy, the homeomorphism on the boundary will kind of have to spin around, you know. And that's what this fractional Dane twist coefficient measures. It measures. 
and so, anyway, because of, the, because of this fact, you can now, this flow on the n-fold cyclic cover, you can now extend it to a pseudo-nosal flow on the, on, on the branch cover. And now, you know, uh, Caligari and Fenley, possibly other people, I mean, they studied uh, pseudo-nosal flows on three manifolds, and um, you can lift the flow to the universal cover, which is R3. Um, they showed that, you know, the orbit space of the flow is just uh, R2, and you get this faithful action of the fundamental group of the manifold on R2. And then they show that, in fact, this action extends to the disk. So it extends to the circle of infinity. And so the bottom line is that you end up with, an, you know, with a representation of the fundamental group into the group of orientation-preserving homeomorphisms of the circle. So you get this injective homeomorphism. We'd like to show that this guy is left orderable, so we'd like to promote this to a representation at the homeoplast of the real line, right? And there's an obstruction to doing that, but, so I mean, here's a gen the general picture is you have this representation row, you have this universal covering group, so you have this Z, you have this Z subgroup of the orientation homeo, orientation preserving homeoplast of the real line, generated by translation by one, uh, and so, you know, you get this, um, you, the homeomorphs of the real line to commute with translations. You know, you get, this, you get this map here, and the kernel is this central Z. And you'd like to lift this homomorphs to here. So now you're in here. And the obstruction to doing that, you know, is in the, there's this Euler class in the second cohomology of the, well, of the group, but it's really of the, of the manifold. Uh, and in general, you know, this may be non-zero, but it turns out in this case, for this particular situation, because, you know, it's because, well, the, because we're looking at these n-fold cyclic branch covers. Anyway, it turns out you can show that this, the fact, vanishes. And so you end up with a, with a lift, and so therefore, this group embeds in this group, which is left orderable, and, uh, and so therefore it's left orderable. Let me finally say something about the toroidal case, um, perhaps even more briefly. Um, there, so there we have this essential torus T in the, not, in the link exterior, and I'm assuming, remember, that it's, it's a knotted, so it splits S3 into two pieces, one of which is a solid torus, and the other is a non-trivial non-exterior, okay. And we can look at the link, the, the pieces of the link that lie in X1 and X2. Now, L, L, so let Li be L intersect Xi. L1 is definitely not empty, right? Because X1's a solid torus, and if L1 was empty, then the torus T would be compressible, right? So L1 is definitely um, not empty. If L2 is empty, then this is what we call a satellite link, and we can handle that case, but, but it's a slightly different picture. So let me, let me assume, just uh, for specificity, that, that L2 is also non-zero. And so we've got these two pieces, X1 and X2, we've got some links in here, and when you go to the n-fold cyclic branch curve of the whole link, you can think of that as the union of two manifolds with boundary, where mi is just, it's some cyclic branch cover of xi branched over li. And this boundary here, it's gonna be some disjoint union of tori, right, because it's just, it's just a covering of t. But if there's more than one torus, then that means that the first Betty number of this is, um, because these guys are connected, if there's more than one torus here, then this will have positive first Betty number. H1 will be infinite, and we know that we're, we're good there, right? Because <clears throat> any, any manifold with infinite H1 satisfies all these three properties. So we might as well assume that um, M is connected. And so now we've got this situation where we've, um, we've got a three manifold that's a union of two manifolds with torus boundary, incompressible torus boundary, and we we'll glue them together along this torus, and we want to know, is this guy left orderable? Is the fundamental group left orderable? Or we also want to know, is it an L space and so on. In the case of L spaces, this has actually been done by uh, Rasmussen, Hanselman, and Watson. Hanselman, Ras Rasmussen, and Watson. Uh, in the LO setting, which is what we're in here, Boyer and Clay uh, set this up. And, and they showed that whenever you have this kind of situation, you glue two manifolds together like this, there's a set of slopes on the boundary of each of them with the property that if there's a slope on this common boundary, that's in, these are called the LO detected slopes in it. So if there's a slope that's LO detected in M1 and it's also LO detected in M2, then the resulting manifold has left, is LO, it has left over a fundamental group. And um, 
I might say that you, you might think, well, I don't know, you, you might think that maybe these slopes, uh, um, maybe, maybe, maybe these slopes, you know, they're just the slopes that when you Dane fill along a slope and you get something with left order of fundamental group, maybe that's what you should mean by an LO slope, you know. But in fact, that's, that's not quite true. That's, it's larger than that, luckily. <laughs> um, uh, certainly anything like that will be LO detected, but the set is actually larger than that. And so let me just very briefly say we could use this theorem to show that, in fact, uh, in this setting, there is a slope here that's LO detected in both M1 and M2. And the key point really is that because X2 is a non-trivial exterior but not an S3, then the meridian is LO detected in X2. So you see, it's not true that if you Dane fill X2 along the meridian, you, you, you get S3, which does not have left orbital fundamental group, but, but nevertheless, this uh, meridian. So that's kind of the key point. But anyway, the basic thing is that we use, you use, you reduce it to this problem about gluing two manifolds together along a torus, and <clears throat> you, we can use this theorem. So let me just, okay, so what are the problems left? Well, obviously you want to, we want to do the case, the LO case where the essential torus, you know, is unknotted, okay. And we also want to prove the NLS and CTF versions, of course. For example, I think I mentioned this before, this is a very first step. You'd like to show that if you have a fiber strongly quasi-positive knot that's hyperbolic, then, see, we know it's already NLS for N equal to six, but you'd like to show that it's N equal to five. So anyway, but let's, let's come back to Alison Moore's question. Um, in, in the paper with, with uh, in the work with Michelle and Steve, we actually um, looked a little uh, deeper into, into the L-space knot case, and we showed the following, that if you have an L-space knot, if some cyclic branch covers an L-space, then as I've already mentioned, N has to be at most five, I've already said that, you know, because L-space knots are five and it's only quasi-positive. But it turns out if you have this stronger condition that it's actually an L-space knot, then in fact you can also show that if N is four or five, then you have to be the trefoil. And if N is three, you're either the trefoil or the two five torus knot. See, the three four branch cover of the two five torus knot, it's also a finite fundamental group. It's the Poincare homology sphere. Or, this is a case we couldn't roll out, you could conceivably be hyperbolic and be a knot with the same polynomial as the, the, the two, two five torus knot. So because you're an L space knot, you'd be fiber with genus two and so on and so on. And very recently, this great theorem of Farber, Reynoso, and Wang, they showed actually that the only genus two L space knot is in fact the two five torus knot. And so when you put these two together now, you get a very strong statement. If you have any L space knot other than T, the T two three or T two five, then the cyclic branch cover and uh, sigma sub n, it's, NL, it's not an L space, at least for all n, greater equal to three. So we started, we started off looking at Alison Moore's question. Uh, she asked it for n equals two and NLS. We proved it if we replace NLS with LO. We also proved it if you replace n equals two by n greater equal to three. <laughs> And, but the original question is still unanswered. So it's, uh, yeah, she knew exactly what question to ask. It was kind of wonderful, really. It's a hard, the hardest case. So anyway, I'll stop there, and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, any question, comment, here or online? Maybe I have one question. Okay. Uh, do you know Do you know something in the among the family of irregular uh, dihedral branch cover? Irregular dihedral cover. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. We. That's 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 more complicated, right? I mean, uh, yeah. Even for three four, for example. Yeah. We we didn't look at that. No. Yeah. I don't know if there's a any sort of. I mean, you can get S three, of course. Um, you, yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. I mean, you, as you know, you can't look at arbitrary covers, right? Because every three manifold is a <coughs> yeah, yeah, but uh, is a branch cover of the figure eight knot. So um, yeah, yeah. Um, that's true, but uh, not on a knot. You need to be I'm sorry. If, if it's uh, even on, a, if you take on a knot. Yeah, every three manifold. Yeah, every three manifold is, is a branch cover of the figure eight knot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of remarkable. Yeah. 
Also, yeah. Sorry, I just want to ask why is this ADE classification is related to these properties? I mean, all you conjecture the. Oh well, well, I mean, you can. I mean, it's because. I mean, you can kind of see in some sense, right? I mean, it's it's not it's not clear, right? But you can see that they're certainly going to be accept accepted. Okay, see, even let, let's just start with a very simple case. Let's just look at torus knots, right? The, the, the special case of the cipher manifold, torus knots. So the ADE torus knots are the two Q torus knots, right? Right, because they're the, and then the the, the tref, uh, the, sorry, the two Q torus knots, the three four and the three five, right? Torus knots. So they're the only, and so we know that they have the property that um, <coughs> one of their cyclic branch covers, namely the double branch cover, you know, is not left orderable. It is an L space. I mean, that's finite fundamental group. It's easy to sh so it's easy to show. You see that if you take any other if you take any other torus knot then all the cyclic branch covers, they have infinite fundamental group, right? But there are plenty of siphon fiber spaces with infinite fundamental group that, that, that are not left orderable, that are L spaces and so on. So in some sense, even that, it's somewhat of a surprise that in fact, in fact, they are all left orderable as soon as they become infinite, you know, just for this special class of, of uh, and so, yeah, I mean, uh, so, so the fact that you have to rule out the ADE links, yeah, that's clear, you know, because you get these fun. But the fact that that's all you have to rule out, rule out, I mean, it's not even immediately clear, even, even in the Seifert case, right? I mean, um, but uh, so that's, yeah, that's what's sort of su surprising about the, about the whole thing, I think, that you just have to rule out these guys. Again, among the family of fiber strongly quasi-positive. Other question? Okay, if not, let's thank Cameron again.